Welcome all. Today we begin Bhagavad Gita as it is. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Mukam Karoti Vajalam Bhangum Langhate Grimit Kripatamam Vande Shri Gurum Dina Tarinam Parmananda Madhavam Shri Chaitanya Ishwara. Manchakar Patal Vesha, Kripasunda Vevacha, Patitanam Bhava Nepu, Vaishna Vepu, Namodama. So we begin with setting the scene from Bhagavad Gita as it is. Although widely published and read by itself, Bhagavad Gita originally appears as an episode in the Mahabharat, the epic Sanskrit history of the ancient world. The Mahabharata tells of events leading up to the present age of Kali. It was at the beginning of his, this age, some 50 centuries ago, that Lord Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita to his friend and devotee Arjuna. In other words, more than 500 years ago, the discourse, one of the greatest philosophical and religious dialogues known to man, took place just before the onset of a war. A great fratricidal conflict between the hundred sons of Dhritarashtra and on the opposing side their cousins the Pandavas or sons of Pandu. So Dhritarashtra and Pandus were brothers born in the Kuru dynasty, descending from King Bharat, a former ruler of the earth from whom the name Mahabharat derives. Because Dhritarashtra, the elder brother, was born blind, the throne that otherwise would have been his was passed down to his younger brother, Pandu. When Pandu died at an early age, his five children, Yudhishthir, Bhim, Arjun, Nakul and Sahadev, came under the care of Dhritarashtra, who in effect became, for the time being, the king. Thus the sons of Dhritarashtra and those of Pandu grew up in the same household, it was a royal household. Both were trained in the military arts by the expert Drona and counseled by the revered grandfather of the clan, Bhishma. Yet the sons of Dhritarashtra, especially the eldest Duryodhan, hated and envied the Pandavas. And the blind and evil-minded Dhritarashtra wanted his own sons, not those of Pandu, to inherit the kingdom. Thus Duryodhan with Dhritarashtra's consent plotted to kill the young sons of Pandu and it was only by the careful protection of their uncle Vidur and their cousin Lord Krishna that the Pandavas escaped the many attempts against their lives. Now Lord Krishna was not an ordinary man but the supreme God himself who had descended to earth and was playing the role of a prince in a contemporary dynasty. In this role, he was also the nephew of Pandu's wife Kunti or Pritha, the mother of the Pandavas. So both as a relative and as, an, as the eternal upholder of the religion, Krishna favoured the righteous sons of Pandu and protected them. So ultimately, however clever Duryodhan challenged the Pandavas to a gambling match, in the course of that fateful tournament, Duryodhan and his brothers took possession of Draupadi, the chaste and devoted wife of the Pandavas. And insultingly, they tried to strip her naked before the entire assembly of princes and the kings. But Krishna's divine intervention saved her, as we all know. But the gambling which was rigged cheated the Pandavas of their kingdom and forced them into 13 years of exile. Now upon returning from the exile, the Pandavas rightfully requested their kingdom from Duryodhan, who bluntly refused to yield it. Duty bound as princes to serve in public administration, the five Pandavas reduced their request to mere five villages. But Duryodhan arrogantly replied that he wouldn't spare them enough land into which to drive even a single pin. Throughout all this, the Pandavas had been consistently tolerant and forbearing, but now war seemed inevitable. Nonetheless, as the princes of the world divided, some siding with the sons of the Dhrashtra, others with the Pandavas, 
Krishna himself took the role of the messenger for the sons of Pandu and went to the court of Dhritarashtra to plead for peace. When his pleas were refused, war was now certain. The Pandavas, men of the highest moral stature, recognized Krishna to be the supreme personality of Godhead, whereas the impious sons of Dhritarashtra, they did not. Yet Krishna offered to enter the war according to the desire of the antagonists. As God, he would not personally fight, but whoever so desired might avail himself of Krishna's army. And the other side could have Krishna himself as an advisor and helper. Duryodhan, the political genius, snatched at Krishna's armed forces while Pandavas were equally eager to have Krishna himself. In this way, Krishna became the charioteer of Arjun. Like we famously say, Parthasarthi, Partha was another name of Arjun, taking it upon himself to drive the fabled bowman's chariot. This brings us to the point at which Bhagavad Gita begins, with the two armies arrayed, ready for combat, and Dhritarashtra anxiously inquiring of his secretary, Sanjay, what did they do? The scene is set with only the need for a brief note regarding this translation and commentary. The general pattern translators have followed in rendering Bhagavad Gita into English has been to brush aside the person Krishna to make room for their own concepts and philosophies. The history of the Mahabharata is taken as quaint mythology and Krishna becomes a poetic device for presenting the ideas of some anonymous genius, or at best, he becomes a minor historical personage. But the person Krishna is both the goal and the substance of Bhagavad Gita, so far as to Gita speaks of itself. So Krishna is the goal and Krishna is the substance of this epic Bhagavad Gita. This translation then and the commentary that accompanies it propose to direct the reader to Krishna rather than away from him. In this Bhagavad Gita as it is, is unique, also unique is the Bhagavad Gita, thus becomes wholly consistent and comprehensible. Since Krishna is the speaker of the Gita and its ultimate goal as well, this is necessarily the only translation that presents this great scripture in its true terms. So now we are on the preface. So this is from Prabhupada. Prabhupada says, originally I wrote Bhagavad Gita as it is in the form in which it is presented now. When this book was published, the original manuscript was unfortunately cut short to less than 400 pages without illustrations and without explanations for most of the original verses of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita. In all of my other books, Srimad Bhagavatam, Sri Isha Upanishad, etc., the system is that I give the original verse its English transliteration, word-to-word -word Sanskrit to English equivalents, translations and purports. This makes the book very authentic and scholarly and makes the meaning self-evident. I was not very happy, therefore, when I had to minimize my original manuscript, but later on, when the demand for Bhagavad Gita as it is considerably increased, I was requested by many scholars and devotees to present the book in its original form. Thus, the present attempt is to offer the original manuscript of this great book of knowledge with full parampara explanation in order to establish the Krishna consciousness movement more soundly and more progressively. Our Krishna consciousness movement is genuine, historically authorized, natural and transcendental due to its being on Bhagavad Gita as it is based on Bhagavad Gita as it is. It is gradually becoming the most popular movement in the entire world, especially amongst the younger generation. It is becoming more and more interesting to the older generation also. Older gentlemen are becoming interested so much so that the fathers and grandfathers of my disciples are encouraging us by becoming life members of our great society, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. In Los Angeles, many fathers and mothers used to come to see me to express their feelings of gratitude for my 
leading the Krishna consciousness movement throughout the entire world. Some of them said that it is greatly fortunate for the Americans that I have started the Krishna consciousness movement in America. But actually the original father of this movement is Lord Krishna himself. Since it was started a very long time in the human society by disciplic succession, if I have any credit in this connection, it does not belong to me personally, but it is due to my eternal spiritual master, his divine grace, Om Vishnu Pad Paramahans Parivrajak Charya, 108 Shri Srimad Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada, that is the spiritual master of Srila Prabhupada. If personally I have any credit in this matter, it is only that I have tried to present Bhagavad Gita as it is without any adulteration. Before my presentation of Bhagavad Gita as it is, almost all the English editions of Bhagavad Gita were introduced to some to fulfill someone's personal ambitions, but our attempt in presenting Bhagavad Gita as it is, is to present the mission of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. Prabhupada goes on to say, our business is to present the will of Krishna, not that of any mundane speculator like the politician, philosopher or scientist, for they have a very little knowledge of Krishna. Despite all their knowledge, when Krishna says, man mana bhav, mad bhakto, mad yaji, mam namaskuru, etc., we, unlike the so-called scholars, do not say that Krishna and his inner spirit are different. Krishna is absolute. Krishna is complete. Krishna is total. And there is no difference between Krishna's name, Krishna's form, Krishna's qualities, Krishna's pastimes, etc. This absolute position of Krishna is difficult to understand for any person who is not a devotee of Krishna in the system of parampara or the disciplic succession. Generally, the so-called scholars, politicians, philosophers and the swamis without perfect knowledge of Krishna try to banish or kill Krishna when writing commentary on Bhagavad Gita. Such unauthorized commentary upon Bhagavad Gita is known as Mayavad Bhashya and Lord Chaitanya has warned us about these unauthorized men. Lord Chaitanya clearly says that anyone who tries to understand Bhagavad Gita from the Mayavadi point of view will commit a great blunder. The result of such a blunder will be that the misguided student of Bhagavad Gita will certainly be bewildered on the path of spiritual guidance and will not be able to go back to home, back to Godhead. So Prabhupada is saying to us that our only purpose to present this Bhagavad Gita as it is in order to guide the conditioned student to the same purpose for which Krishna descends to this planet once in a day of Brahma or in 8.6 um, nearly billion, 8.6 billion years. This purpose is stated in Bhagavad Gita and we have to accept it as it is. Otherwise, there is no point in trying to understand the Bhagavad Gita and its speaker. Lord Krishna first spoke Bhagavad Gita to the sun god some hundreds of millions of years ago. We have to accept this fact and thus understand the historical significance of Bhagavad Gita. Without misinterpretation on the authority of Krishna, to interpret Bhagavad Gita without any reference to the will of Krishna is the greatest offense. In order to save oneself from this offense, one has to understand the Lord as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as he was directly understood by Krishna. Sorry, understood by Arjun, Lord Krishna's first disciple. So Lord Krishna's first disciple was Arjun here on this earth. Such understanding of Bhagavad Gita is really profitable and authorized for the welfare of human society in fulfilling the mission of life. Now Krishna consciousness movement is essential in human society for it offers the highest perfection of life. How this is so is explained fully in Bhagavad Gita. Unfortunately, the mundane wranglers have taken advantage of Bhagavad Gita to push forward their demonic propensities and misled people regarding right understanding of the simple principles of life. Everyone should know how God or Krishna is great and everyone should know the factual position of the living entities 
Everyone should know that a living entity is eternally a servant and that unless one serves Krishna, one has to serve illusion or maya in different varieties of the three modes of material nature, namely goodness, passion and ignorance, and thus wander perpetually within the cycle of birth and death. Even the so-called liberated mayavadi speculator has to undergo this process. This knowledge constitutes a great science. And each and every living being has to hear it for his own interest. People in general, especially in the age of Kali, are enamored by the external energy of Krishna and they wrongly think that by advancement of material comforts, every man will be happy. They have no knowledge that the material or external nature is very strong, for everyone is strongly bound by the stringent laws of material nature or Maya. A living entity is happily the part and parcel of, parcel of Lord and thus his natural function is to render immediate service to the Lord. By the spell of illusion, one tries to be happy by serving his personal sense gratification in different forms which will never make him happy. Instead of satisfying his own personal material senses, he has to satisfy the senses of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of life. The Lord wants this and he demands this. One has to understand this central point of Bhagavad Gita. Our Krishna conscious movement is teaching the whole world this central point and because we are not polluting the theme of Bhagavad Gita as it is, anyone seriously interested in deriving benefit by studying the Bhagavad Gita must take help from the Krishna consciousness movement for practical understanding of Bhagavad Gita under the direct guidance of the Lord. So Prabhupada finishes the preface by saying that we hope therefore that people will derive the greatest benefit by studying Bhagavad Gita as it is, as we have presented it here. And if even one man becomes a pure devotee of the Lord, we shall consider our attempt a success. So we have read Setting the Scene and the Preface by Srila Prabhupada and then we will go through the introduction and then only we will commence going through the 700 verses and we'll try to go through them in as simple language as possible so we all can benefit from it. So with that, with these words, I'll take your leave. Thank you, Narayan Kesha Prabhu and Shamita for joining today. We'll continue our journey with the Bhagavad Gita as it is tomorrow. Hare Krishna.